Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be with you all uh, again. Um, I can make all kinds of jokes about being last, and um, but you know, uh, hopefully you will stay awake. <clears throat> Um, I want to share with you uh, several things. I'm not sure what all you heard this morning about uh, the, the latest Quality Counts uh, study. I do want to highlight some of that information because that is the most recent information that we have uh, on, um, I guess, considering an outside assessment uh, of Georgia's educational system. As you know, Ed Week does this study every year. They have for the like, last five years. Uh, one thing they did differently this year, in the past they have, they, they look at, when they study the system, they look at over 100 different indicators grouped into the six categories that you heard um, uh, Steve mention the, the, the grades that, that we received. When you look at the indicators in each of those, there are over 100 different indicators that they look at in this study. It's everything from policies that the state has to standards to actual student outcomes. There are a number of, uh, pro, there are a number of um, rating systems out there that don't even include student outcomes. Uh, so I caution folks about you know, looking at what they're, they're assessing. Um, so uh, one thing that they did not do this year that they have done in the past is take all of the grades on all of those indicators and roll them up into a single report card grade for the state system and rank that state and rank the states. They did not rank them this year. As you know, um, over the last two years, for the last two consecutive years, uh, they've ranked the quality of Georgia's educational system seventh in the nation based on all of that. So the student achievement piece is what we will be focusing on somewhat today. I'll, I'll mention some others uh, because they, they tend to be more policy uh, oriented. Uh, but I do want you to know uh, about the student achievement piece. <clears throat> Um, as uh, Steve said, it, the report does have Georgia ranked 17th in the nation uh, in overall student achievement. I think what is important to know uh, about uh, how they came up with that ranking is they're not just looking at uh, overall performance. As, as Kelly had mentioned earlier, you know, we're focusing on growth as a state as well. We're not just holding systems accountable for performance. We're holding them accountable for growth. Well, this particular um, study, uh, states were given grades on overall achievement. They were given grades for uh, growth, student growth, over a 10-year period from 2003 to 2013. They were given uh, credit for um, closing the poverty gap between students of poverty and students of non-poverty. Uh, and so when you look at all of those, I want to highlight some, some successes for Georgia. Again, 17th overall, only one other state in the southeast scored higher than Georgia, ranked higher than Georgia, and that was Florida. Uh, their, their score was about a 75, and Georgia's was a little over 70. So we're fairly close uh, in actual numerical grade. Now, um, they did look at the National Assessment of Educational Progress, fourth and eighth grade reading and math. They looked at, um, again, the, the performance. They looked at the tenure growth in each of those. They looked at poverty gap closure. They looked at graduation rates and the tenure growth of the states and graduation rates. And they looked at uh, advanced placement exams, not only in performance, but in tenure growth. So as noted in the press release yesterday, um, here the highlights. Uh, we ranked fifth in the nation on 10-year achievement gains for fourth grade reading on the NAEP. Uh, so uh, a lot of folks may say, well, we're not performing. I think we actually met national average this year on fourth grade reading. But Georgia is receiving high marks for making gains over that 10-year period. So uh, again, ranked fifth in the nation on 10-year achievement gains for fourth grade reading, ranked fifth in the nation on the poverty gap closure for eighth grade mathematics on the NAEP, ranked 10th in the nation for the 10-year increase in high school graduation rates, ranked 5th in the nation in advanced placement scores, uh, the change, the growth in advanced placement scores, and overall ranked 9th in the nation in the percentage of our students passing advanced placement exams and earning college credit while still in high school. For the second consecutive year, Georgia was also ranked first in the nation with a score of 100 in the transitions and alignment category 
uh, in the quality count study. Uh, that score comes from the state enacting 14 policies examined by Ed Week, including curriculum alignment from pre-kindergarten pre through college and programs to help students not meeting school readiness benchmarks. In the report, Georgia also ranked 18th in the nation and received an A- for standards, assessment, and accountability. This section of the report looks at each state's academic standards in English language arts, math, science, and social studies. Georgia actually received a perfect score of 100 for standards compared to the national average of 87.3. Another section where Georgia performed well was in the teaching profession. That's one of the six uh, categories. Georgia ranked 10th in the nation in its efforts to improve teacher quality. Now, as you can tell, uh, things are a little bit better uh, than the perception that most people have about Georgia's public education system. Uh, as I've always said and will continue to say, do we have room to grow? Absolutely. We are not where we need to be. But we're headed in the right direction. Now, one of the areas in the report where we did not fare too well, and you've heard that discussed uh, extensively in the last session, was in the area they classify as school finance analysis, especially in the subcategory of per pupil expenditures. We ranked 40th in the nation, over $2,000 per pupil below the national average. Now, please. Don't hear me say that spending more money is, is necessarily the answer. But as you heard from our representatives and our senators, uh, our schools are starving in many of our districts. Uh, and because of the increase in poverty in this state and in the increase in our students uh, who are living in poverty, over uh, approximately 60% of our student population in Georgia participates in the free and reduced lunch program. It's a heavier lift. Poverty is not an excuse for underachievement, but it is a heavier lift. Many times it takes different resources. It takes additional resources. When you consider students coming to school in a variety of ranges of preparation for school, so sometimes it takes different resources, uh, additional resources. It takes additional time. Uh, for, for us to catch students up to where they need to be. In this quality counts report, there is also something called a chance for success index, which is based on multiple indicators, including family income. Georgia ranked 44th in the nation in family income. This is getting, again, back to the poverty issue. Parental education, we ranked 38th in the nation, and that's, that's defined as at least one parent in the home having a, uh, a minimum of a bachelor's degree. Uh, parental employment, at least one parent having a full-time job, 40th in the nation. And as you all, if, if you read uh, Tom Crawford's article last week, uh, as I did, or maybe before last, I don't know, my days kind of run together now. Uh, while we have had an increase in the number of, of jobs created in this state, we have seen a significant rise in the number of people in our state living in poverty. Poverty has a significant impact on our educational system. Again, it is not an excuse, and we are meeting that challenge head on, but we have to fund education appropriately. Now, Georgia is below the national average in all of those areas that I just mentioned. Overall, Georgia ranks 38th in the nation for the chance of student success. That uh, sort of coincides, if you um, uh, remember the um, Kids Count. Uh, it's a similar study, but it's released every year. And in the uh, 2013 Kids Count report, Georgia actually slipped uh, in its uh, rankings from 36th in the nation to 43rd uh, when it comes to uh, our children. So um, lots of indicators that point to um, poverty in our schools and the chance for success. Now. There is good news there in what we're doing educationally and what I've already mentioned to you that uh, we were recognized in the report, specifically in the area of 8th grade mathematics, of closing the, the achievement gap with our students of poverty. Again, we have a lot to do. We have a lot. There are a lot of other areas out there that we need to continue to work on. But again, I think we're heading in the right direction. <clears throat> now, 
Some of you are familiar with a, um, a letter that I released last week, and I'm going to point out some things from that because it goes right in step with what um, the gentleman spoke about earlier, our senator and our, and our representative, and I was so very glad to hear uh, their remarks. But I spent some time uh, back before Christmas visiting schools uh, in the southern part of our state, uh, and uh, I was in some cases very impressed by what I saw from teachers and from achievement gains that schools are making to um, being very frustrated uh, and in some cases angry at the conditions that uh, the students were attending school in. Uh, now we have heard um, a lot of cries about the dire situation of the state budget, the state economy, and I appreciate Senator Tippins and his comments about we have to make a decision. What is the most important thing for us to invest in? Uh, austerity cuts began in 2003. Districts have not been receiving uh, what they have earned since 2003. Over $7 billion to date uh, when you include this year. Well, we haven't seen the budget this year, but I'm sure we'll go over $8 billion. <clears throat> now understand too that the state funding formula was written 30 years ago implemented 29 years ago and the funding levels haven't changed as far as the rate of funding so for example when QBE was implemented in 1985 we were paying districts for substitute teachers somewhere in the neighborhood of $16 to $18 a day for a substitute teacher. 2014, we're paying districts $16 to $18 a day for a sub. That hasn't changed. That's what, when I say that we're not funding at the same rates, we've never adjusted this formula for inflation. Never. And so uh, what's happening to local districts and why they are hurting so much is that cost of that sub, the average, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm basing this on my experience from different school districts, so this is not a, a scientific average, but based on my experience working in school districts around the area, uh, the, uh, the going rate for sub is about $65 a day. The state is paying the district about $18 for that sub. Okay, That's a big difference. And when you go to textbooks, it's the same issue. We're funding them, we're giving them over the textbooks based on the prices of textbooks nearly 30 years ago. That's why a number of districts aren't buying textbooks. They simply can't afford it. And when we talk about giving districts flexibility, many of those items used to, you know, well, they're, they're in that QBE, and districts have flexibility on how they use that QBE. So many of them now are using the money that they might have used for textbooks to pay teacher salaries, to keep teachers employed. So there are a number of reasons why uh, districts may not be uh, may not be using textbooks or purchasing textbooks. Um, so, giving the conditions, you know, that I, I mean, I was in schools that um, they they turned the lights off uh, in the hall all day, but just to save money on the power bill. Uh, schools that were carpeted, that it was gone. I mean, you saw the uh, the seams, but the carpet was pretty much gone. Uh, water fountains that obviously had been, I guess, that, that broke, that were removed from the walls rather than being fixed. There are some serious conditions uh, in our schools. And the fact that our teachers uh, in this state have been able to move the needle on student achievement as much as they have to me is something short of miraculous. Um, in addition to what I've told you at the beginning, currently, <clears throat> Georgia ranks higher than it ever has in its state history in SAT scores. ACT scores, advanced placement test scores, and we are graduating more seniors than we ever have in state history, with increased expectations. There are only seven states in the country, a lot of people talk about grad rates, guys. There are only seven states in the country that have as equal or there's only, well, there's only one state in the country that, ha that has higher a higher number of units of credit to earn a high school diploma than Georgia does. Georgia is the only state in the nation that requires its students to have four units of science 
Well, let me take that back. When you look at the seven states who their college prep diploma is the default diploma for all children, Georgia is the only one of those seven that requires four units of science to graduate. Many don't require four units of math. So the expectations, even while we've raised expectations of our students, we're still raising the number of students who are graduating, which is, in my opinion, uh, a, a very much a success. My concern, and many folks say, well, if you're doing so well, why does funding matter? Well, when you look at, and you heard some of the folks talk about the instructional calendars, we have a, a handful of districts, four or five in the state, that are below 150 days this year. 144 days, 146 days. Y'all, that's nearly two months of lost instructional time for those students. That will have a significant impact on the students in those districts. We have to prioritize educational spending, especially in our most rural districts. Because what message are we sending to those students? What message are we sending to them? You don't, you're not as important? You don't count as much as kids in Metro Atlanta? We have to prioritize our spending. Um, as you've heard, teachers have been laid off. Over 4,000 teachers in the last several years have lost their jobs in the state of Georgia. Class sizes are larger. Programs in a lot of these districts, like art and music, have been cut out completely. <clears throat> teachers have been furloughed. Uh, over 90% of teachers, I know you heard from the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute, they recently did a survey. About 90% of our districts responded to their survey. 80% of those responding, over 80% of those responding, have furloughed teachers in order to uh, meet budget. A lot of people will point the finger in that particular case to Logan Central Offices and administrations. That may be the case in isolated situations, but in most of our districts, it absolutely is not. We actually have 12 of our school districts in this state right now that are operating with a 49% superintendent. They're being paid less than 20 hours a week. We have a handful of districts of these small ones that the um, superintendent is also the high school principal. It's one and the same. <clears throat> I'm going to skip through some of this. It, they alluded, um, again, our, our legislators alluded to this a little bit earlier. Um, it is, um, a lot of people have said, you know, they've taken on the mantra that it doesn't, it shouldn't matter where your zip code is. Every child in the state requires a quality education. What we need to realize is that costs money. And in some cases, it costs more than others. Because in some rural districts, they don't have access to the uh, bandwidth that they need uh, for the students. There are extremely dedicated teachers in these schools. Are there some that aren't? Absolutely, just like any profession. You know reporters that aren't as dedicated as you. Okay? That happens in any profession. Um, but these teachers are doing the best they can. I literally saw textbooks duct taped together. Duct tape. Because, and, and these books are over 15 years old. <clears throat> and this may be a stretch, but I, you know, I, I believe that there are uh, people that would look like nothing more than to see the public education system fail. And, and if it's a strategy to do that by uh, not funding it, to then be able to point a finger and say you're not being successful and therefore we have to privatize, that would be doing a lot of our children in this state a, a tremendous disservice. Because I think you know as well as I do, that there are not many for-profit companies or private schools that are going to go into these, the rural parts of our state and educate uh, the children. Many of them will not. They're just not, it, it's not profitable. It's too small. But every one of those children counts. Uh, I saw in one of these schools a child that was nine years old. The principal was walking down the hall with me and the, the child, we're walking by this child, she's uh, obviously on a um, handmade kind of walker made out of PVC pipe. 
she's blind, she's walking with her teacher, uh, and he said, you know, when she came to this school, she didn't walk. Both of her parents are deceased, and she's nine years old. Thank God for that school and those teachers. There was another young man, we went into a classroom, and, and uh, he asked, you know, he was highlighting some kids, and we left, and he said, you know, the young man that stood up, his, both of his parents have abandoned him. He lives by himself in a trailer, and the football coach is the only reason he comes to school. A lot of folks aren't going to invest in those children, but we are certainly dedicated teachers who are. Uh, these stories are repeated in every school in this state, even in urban and suburban areas. As, they, as these gentlemen had alluded to, we need to invest in education. 2012, there was a promise made in the budget to end teacher furloughs. That hasn't happened. We need to end teacher furloughs. A pay raise would be nice, but as you heard them say earlier, um, what teachers want more than the raise is the restoration of austerity to end their furloughs. If we shortchange our children now, we will greatly pay for it in the future. Doing the right thing isn't usually complicated. It's sometimes costly, but it's not complicated. We know that the right thing is to appropriately fund our schools. It may be costly, but it's not complicated. What will be even more costly is the adverse impact on our students if they aren't prepared for the world that awaits them. <clears throat> now, most of you know that I decided not to run again to take superintendent. And it's no secret that I'm running for governor instead. And the reason that I am doing that is I feel like that that is the office from which I can make the greatest impact in my mind on the single most important investment that this state can make, and that's education. Because education, if we want to get at poverty, education is the way to break poverty cycles. Now, let me talk briefly about Common Core and assessments, and then I will take some questions. How am I doing on time? You have until 2.40. <coughs> okay, all right, good. Let me talk briefly about Common Core assessments, and then I'll take a couple of questions. Um, back in the summer, uh, I began work with our recent districts to um, conduct a survey of our educators across the state of year one implementation of the Common Core. Uh, Any time that you uh, embark on a huge initiative such as Common Core, you always, always do a review of implementation. Just like you heard Matt talk about the College and Career Ready Performance Index, we did a review after year one implementation and we made some adjustments, we made some refinements. Um, that was the same thing, it was the same um, uh, thinking that I had when I asked the Reese's to uh, conduct a survey of our teachers across the state. I wanted them in every school in the state. Uh, I wanted to know what teachers thought. They are the ones who are implementing the standards. Uh, they're the ones that are seeing students perform uh, and get their feedback and their opinion uh, on year one implementation. What went well, what didn't go well? Are there refinements that need to be made or are there adjustments that need to be made? Um, after that, um, the, the governor in the fall asked that the state board do review of uh, the Common Core Standards, which they are going to take this as part of that review. They're also doing some other things. They're being required to hold some, uh, some hearings in their districts that they represent uh, on the Common Core, and, and those things are planned. They're supposed to put together a panel of experts to compare the uh, previous Georgia Performance Standards with the Common Core Standards, and, and all of that will be rolled together. <coughs> I can tell you that based on what I've seen of, of the over 11,000 responses that we uh, received from teachers across the state, over 80% of our teachers in the state um, are in favor of keeping the standards. They like the standards, they want to keep them. Um, there are recommendations for refinements and that's exactly what I wanted to see. I wanted to know from our teachers, I can look at English standards, but I can't tell you about math standards, I taught English. So I need to know from my math teachers what's going on. So there are, some, there are some solid recommendations, I think, in there that we probably need to look at. Uh, and we will um, bring those together with the other information that the board uh, may, uh, I guess, accumulate in their discussions across the state. Uh, and if there is a need for recommendations for refinement, 
I'll make those recommendations for refinement. There are people that say the standards are copyrighted. You can't do that. If we make refinements to the standard and they're no longer completely aligned to the Common Core, we'll have the College and Career Ready Georgia Performance Standards and we won't call it the Common Core. You can't, you, you can't copyright a standard that a student shall be able to um, multiply two times two. I mean, that's, <clears throat> so, our teachers are in favor of the standards. We're not making any uh, recommendations for pulling out of the standards. Um, there probably will be some suggestions for refinements, but again, guys, those will be refinements. They won't be anything that will, uh, they'll only be uh, meant to improve what we have. Uh, they, they won't be anything significant that would require any type of uh, training of teachers or anything like that. Just simple, simple refinements, clarifications, and those types of things. Um, and as far as the assessments, I will tell you where we are at this point. Um, we have, um, my assessment director has been working for uh, the last couple of months uh, in conjunction with other states, uh, working on an RFP that we will release, um, expect to release sometime this month um, for our new assessment system. I will tell you that in 2015, we will not have the CRCT. Uh, and we will, uh, I say we won't, we will have in the course test, but they won't be the same, okay? Um, what we are looking for uh, in our RFP is a single uh, aligned testing system. Uh, the CRCT is completely different than the EOCT. They don't align. So what we're looking for are tests that align vertically uh, 3 through 12. A lot of folks say, and I agree, we test too much. A lot of that testing is driven by the federal government. We can't change that. We have to test every grade level, three through eight, uh, in English, language, arts, and mathematics. Um, there's not a state superintendent out there that I know that's in favor of that model. Most would like to do that in gateway years and let each state uh, measure its own student progress in between. But that's not happening. There is no interest at the federal level of changing that. In fact, when we submitted our waiver um, for No Child Left Behind, we had to include testing at grades three through eight. So um, that's driven by the government or the federal government. Um, now, when I say that we will not have the CRCT, um, whatever tests that we use for federal accountability have to be approved by the U.S. Department of Education. It goes through a, um, a peer review process. If it doesn't pass peer review, you can't use it. So their standards are changing. So the test that we currently have won't meet the standard for 15. That's we have to change our test. Uh, it will be um, park like in its design, in that there are some expectations that we have constructive response items. You know, so that it's no longer an all multiple choice test. Students will have to explain work. They will have to give reasons. They would have to, let's say, cite evidence for their answers. Uh, one of the things that we do plan on doing, though, by embedding the constructive response items within the test, we will be able to eliminate uh, some of our state testing that we do. So, for example, um, the requirement that we have a uh, writing test at grades 3, 5, and 8. We'll be recommending uh, to the legislature, I guess, um, elimination of that because we will be able to generate writing scores from the constructive response items in the new tests. That will help us streamline our testing. And then we will also be combining the English language arts. Uh, currently, we have separate tests in English language arts and reading. Those will be combined into a single test. So in the new design, we're anticipating at least four uh, fewer uh, state tests uh, for our students in the state. Um, and lastly, on assessments, um, we do have a challenge uh, in, in the time frame, as you noted, in the top 10 issues to watch. Uh, we're under a really tight time frame. We have been, for a couple of years now, field testing items aligned with the Common Core. So we have hundreds of those items already that, um, that have already been field tested, have validity and reliability established, and can move forward with those. Uh, we uh, are working on memorandums of understanding right now with other states, such as Florida and Kentucky, to share testing items. Kentucky has already implemented some of the, let's say, the constructive response items. They've already been field tested uh, and uh, reliability and validity established. So uh, we can save time by, by leveraging a partnership with them. So um, with that, um, I do want to just say, uh, I, I want to read this last 
paragraph, and I'll take a couple questions. This is from uh, Steve's group, and, and I so appreciate this. George has done a good job in identifying areas of education reform that will lead to increased student outcomes in high school graduates who are ready for college or to embark on a career. Increased rigor and teacher quality are the right foci to produce these changes. However, the same educators are struggling under the increasing burden of being asked to do more with less with a population of students whose needs are outpacing resources available to help them. By not addressing these issues, Georgia is in danger of not realizing the potential gains uh, this completed puzzle can deliver. And they were highlighting a lot of the uh, good things and the, the good work that we had going on in the department. So, uh, and, that, and that's a completely accurate statement. I'm very concerned that uh, even the gains that we have seen, that we'll begin to see those flat line or even decrease uh, because the loss of instructional time over time uh, uh, in our students that let's say are um, in, in districts where they've cut their school calendar. So, thank you very much. I'll take a couple questions. Yes, Um Do you think the funding formula needs to be changed? Or is it a question of just fully funding it? Well, um, the funding formula is complicated. It is, um, in, most, in, in most regards, a, a fairly uh, reasonable attempt at establishing a basic education and what it costs because it does address the needs of, let's say, uh, a low-income student has greater needs or a special needs student has greater needs or an English language learner has greater needs than your average high school student. So, so the weightings are there to make those accommodations, but I think fully funding it would be extremely helpful. Yes. I know you and the governor have had your differences, um, and the governor has not released his budget yet. Right. But have you received any assurances that there will be more education funding uh, in his budget? I've not had any direct conversations with the governor's office about the budget, so I have no idea what it is. I've read in the paper. That's where my information comes from. Anybody else? Would you have expected, just to follow up on that, I mean, is that unusual? Um, do you normally meet with the governor before in years past? Um, no, we haven't normally gotten that heads up. Maureen, you have one question? Yeah, um, is there any way, I mean, you will not be, whether or not you're governor or not, I can't say, but you won't be state school superintendent. Is there anything that, when you, in, in the next election, the folks running for your office, some of them have fairly radical ideas. Um, is there any way to, I guess, embed what you want to do or to safeguard it or put it in concrete so we don't have someone come in and upend all of this? Because it just seems to me that we're in a position now where if one of your extreme, um, one of the extreme folks running wins, it'll be very curious to see what they'll do with your legacy. Well, that's a very good question. Uh, and yes, there are some ways that some of these have already been safeguarded. Uh, the Career Pathways Initiative is in a statute, House Bill 186. Uh, the Teacher Evaluation System is in statute. Um, so those, those two pieces uh, specifically are, are safeguarded. Uh, the standards, uh, you know, constitutionally the state board has the authority to, to, to adopt standards and curriculum. So um, that's, that's always going to remain unless the Constitution is changed. So. Okay. When you look at the, uh, <clears throat> the budget, where uh, you say more funding needs to go into education, but uh, where does that money come from? I mean, are you talking tax increase? Well, not necessarily, um, because uh, I mean, we saw uh, information today that you know revenues are up for the, you know last month. We have the reserve fund built up to a pretty safe level. Uh, you can uh, begin to use some of those reserve funds without getting into any danger uh, to help offset um, if you want to resource some austerity. Uh, you can, again, prioritize. Look at where we're spending in the state. Uh, do we need to have multiple agencies duplicating the work of other agencies? You know, can you streamline state government uh, to, to realize some cost savings? So there's some things that you can do without increasing taxes to help come up with some of that. But, I mean, we're talking, I mean, if you're close to a billion dollars, you're going to try and make a dent in it. Right. Uh, in, in these other agencies you're talking about, it's, uh, you know, they're about 30% of the whole state budget. You well, know, you could consolidate many of them and still not come yeah. to... Yeah, and, and you're not going to come up with the resources to restore the full billion. 
I fully understand that. But you can start somewhere. And in these rural districts where we're talking things are so bad, their austerity cut is less than a million dollars. You could restore $800,000 to a district, which is every penny of what they lost last year, and they put their kids back in school 180 days. You know, it's, it's, it's not rocket science. You just got to... But can you target specifically for districts? I mean, how do you, you talk about the disparities in yeah. rural Georgia, but how do you, can you realistically get that money to them? Well, I hope At so. The of other I, 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 you know, I, you know, I don't know legally the, the, the ramifications to that, but I would hope that you could. And, and, and we attempt that with things like uh, sparsity grants. We attempt that with uh, the equalization grants. But when you have a county like Hancock that doesn't get equalization, there's something wrong. Well, with that small, relatively small amount of money uh, be sufficient, or would you still call for more funding? Uh, I think that, um, again, you could begin, and you're not going to be able to restore the full billion. I know that. But it's not going to take that to alleviate some of the pressure. We've got to start somewhere. And the, if the economy continues on the track that it's on, then over time you can get back to where we were. Yes, sir? Um, people say over and over again about the new teacher uh, fire energy system. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, we need to be accountable, but um, there's this big timeline between assessments and actual evaluations teachers, um, especially the first year teachers, and also uh, a lot of people are worried about uh, inconsistency of the SLOs developed on the place to everything to say about those things. Well, um, the, the second part of that will be a little bit easier. Uh, the SLO process, um, Senator Tippins made a comment that, that, that I'd actually used with the SLO um, work as well. Um, a lot of folks have asked for us to develop statewide SLOs uh, so that there would be some consistency. That's one of those things that be careful what you wish for because in our elective courses, let's take a course like construction, for example, uh, in the CTAE uh, program. There are some construction programs in the state that are industry certified. Uh, and because they're entry certified, they are required to teach construction, or they're required to teach carpentry, electrical, masonry, and plumbing. You have some construction programs in the state that aren't entry certified, and they only teach carpentry. So what is taught in these classes varies in the elective courses across the state for different reasons, and to standardize that would be extremely difficult. <clears throat> what we have recommended to our districts is to maybe look at doing some district-wide SLO work so it's the same within the district, or even regional, uh, especially in, in, in rural Georgia. You know, maybe the entire RISA has um, a regional type of SLO uh, project. But we have, um, we do have established at the state level an SLO bank where every district that wants to can submit their SLOs and we'll keep them uh, on file for other districts to use. Uh, the, the first piece uh, as far as assessment uh, or evaluation of teachers uh, and the timing of it, um, it will be it will be offset a little bit in, in the beginning, but once we have the full longitudinal data system uh, up and running uh, and, and we have, let's say, online testing, uh, once we have the bandwidth in place in state so we can administer our, t our tests online, we'll get, we'll get our data back quicker and we'll be able to generate some responses. And, you know, having been a principal, um, you know, it's, um, you're, you're going to have that data typically after contracts, but you can have it for the next year going forward. And that, that may not, that's probably not the best, um, the best situation. But if, if, if you're formatively assessing your students throughout the year, rather than just waiting on the summative assessment at the end, um, then you have a pretty good picture of, of student achievement. But the teacher effectiveness measure in the, in the end is going to be based on that summative assessment. All right. Um, One more. Is that me? Yeah. Okay. Um, 
Just curious, uh, the session starts on Monday. Uh, are you going to have anything that you're asking for them, any particular uh, legislation? Uh, the only legislation that we'll be uh, asking for at this point is probably going to be cleanup legislation or language and legislation that already exists for, let's say, example, assessment. Uh, because the assessment language is specifically uh, uh, geared towards CRCT, and that's going to have to be cleaned up. But no, you know, we have enough on our plate. We're asking teachers to do enough already. We've got, we've got plenty of initiatives on our plate, uh, so I have no desire for anything new. All right, thank you all.